everyone. How are we doing? Oh, you guys are fired up. Okay. I don't see any of you with axes and torches, so <laughs> we'll be good. Hey, I want to uh, really quickly, before we get going, just greet people that are watching online. We're, we are broadcasting this one. Um, we don't normally broadcast our Sunday night service, but on occasion, you know, when it's something important, we do. And, um, you know, some of you, uh, someone asked me this week, actually, they said, hey, why are you doing this? This feels a little out of pocket for you. <laughs> and I was like, well, what do you mean? They're like, well, you know, normally you kind of stick just to the gospel and you don't um, handle political issues. And, 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 and I said, well, you're right. I, I tend to not han- handle political issues for, especially on Sunday morning, for a very specific reason. Because I, I believe those end up hindering uh, people from hearing the good news of Jesus. Because what happens right away is someone goes, oh, he's right wing, or oh, he's left wing, and I'm out, because we all live in an echo chamber now. Every one of us, we get our information from an algorithm that feeds us what we want. And the minute we hear something different to us, it's called cognitive dissonance, we get upset and we tune that person out. And the the gospel is preeminent at Clovis Hills. Um, So it's funny, I was... um, having dinner with Pastor Jason Graves last night. And we're about the same age. We planted, this, we started at the same time. We came up together. We've just been very close the whole time. And we had another uh, pastor at the dinner table. And he said to me, he goes, do you feel like our generation of pastors, we abdicated a prophetic voice? And I said, I felt that for the last two years. And he goes, yeah, I have too. So um, I want to find a way to approach a controversial issue because Jesus was full of grace and truth. So um, some of the feedback I got last week, mostly great feedback. And uh, one one woman told me, she she listened online and she she said, you know, I I really, I've been um, in church my whole life and um, I've heard... Christians talk about abortion and kind of the traditional view of it, and um, usually it's with such venom. And she goes, I had an abortion when I was 20, and just hearing that all people are made in God's image um, was very helpful for me and, um, and healing and I'm not really here to give you a political view. I, I still take the Billy Graham road. I'm, I don't, I'm not right wing or left wing. I'm for the whole bird. This isn't a CNN talk or a Fox News talk. Th- to be honest, I think those are worldly and garbage. And we're going to go to God's word. And here's the thing about God's word, though, is that um, it hasn't changed in 3,500 years. And 2,000 years, New Testament, 2,000 years, Old Testament, about 3,500 years. And um, sometimes, it's interesting as Americans, we all love when I get up and, and we preach a sermon on the prodigal son, right? And the son that came home and God welcomed him with open arms. And as Americans, we love forgiveness and acceptance and it's amen, amen. And Jason, when he asked, hey, well, if I'm going to do a parable, can I do the prodigal son? Because that's a home run. And I'm like, well, of course you can do that one. That's an easy one to preach. Um, and we love that. But there are other parts of the Bible that don't butt up against our own cultural sensibilities and, and it gives us cognitive dissonance. Um, if you were to go to another culture, though, if you went to Arab culture, they would read the stuff on the prodigal son and they'd be like, no, he needs to be punished. That's awful. He should not be brought in. You're doing a great dishonor to the older son who's obeyed all the rules. And they would be culturally offended by that story. But then they would look at the Bible's ethics on sexuality and go, it's pretty good. A little liberal, but pretty pretty good. So you have to understand that. You are you're looking, we all are looking with a 21st century cultural sensibility. And what I want to argue is sometimes you come up against God's word, and if God's word is true, and if Jesus really is who he, he said he was, there, of course the Bible is going to disagree with your worldview sometimes. And then you have to decide, 
Am I going to let it transform me or am I going to fight against it or am I going to just not believe it and walk away? That's up to you and God, God respects all of that. But to take the parts you want from the Bible and not take the whole of it, what happens is we end up recreating God in our image. And what I believe is that the doctrine of the image of God changes the way you see everything. And I want to encourage you, if you didn't listen to last week, that you go back and listen because it actually, each of these messages builds on the next. So that first one is very foundational. I'll do a little bit of review just to catch you up for tonight's sake. But I really would encourage you to go back and listen to that, to week one, because they, they all build on each other. Because this belief in all humans being made in the image of God changes the way we read it. It, it, it. You end up looking at issues in our in our country today, not through Fox eyes, not through CNN eyes, not through conservative eyes, not through liberal eyes. You end up looking at them through the word of God. So you guys capetian what I'm saying? All right. So we here's how it'll work. I'm going to do this message. It'll probably be a little longer than we normally do. Normally this service ends at 715. Last week it ended at 730. Um, we'll close the service in about two to five minutes after the service. I will do a Q&A for, for any, anyone that wants to talk. It's just a public forum. Um, and if, if you don't, you can go home and get ready for school tomorrow and, or work tomorrow. And God bless the parents that brought little children to this um, thing. You're warriors, okay? Um, we're hoping by the, by the fall we'll be able to have child care on a Sunday night as well, too. So... Um, I, I, I want to I I start with, with just this. Um, this subject, as the last one, abortion, and the next, next week, sexuality, um, it's incredibly delicate right now. And um, some of it is because there is a, 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 an interesting power dynamic that happens in all humans. It's not just our culture. It's not just our society. It's not whatever it is. Um, I want you to understand this. History is like this. Whoever has the dominant cultural voice of the day usually ends up controlling that. And the way they tend to control it, there's two ways. One, they either do it by might, right? If you live in uh, communist China, right, they're going to do it by the sword. And if you disagree and you publicly speak out or whatever, they, they can arrest you. Um, you can be thrown in jail. Um, in some other countries, you can be killed or you just disappear. And, and, and might makes right. That's one way that power is wielded. Um, in, typically in more peaceful cultures where dialogue might be uh, um, something that we can have, usually what people do to squash any dialogue, whatever, is that they use guilt and shame to shut people up. And I'm going to give you a great example. In the, you know, in the 1950s, 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the religious right had the cultural dominant view of our culture. And they used guilt and shame on any issue they didn't like to shut people up and to keep people down. Ironically, they don't have the cultural voice anymore. They don't have the power. And now there's another group, a secularist group, that uses the, it's a human thing. They use guilt and shame to shut anyone up that disagrees. They say you're immoral, you're a bigot, you're this, you're that. And we're not going to play that game here. We're just going to look, see what God's word says. And if God's a bigot, then he is. Okay? So. Last week, we went over this passage, and we're going to use it as a, as a foundation for, for all three weeks, and it comes out of Genesis 1, 26 through 28, and because it is God's word, and we do hold it high, we believe it, 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 it is um, his, his inerrant word, inerrant in all truth, um, I would love it if you would stand in honor of God's word as we read from Genesis 1, verses 26 through 28. This is the part where God, he's already made most of the earth and the cosmos, and now he's making man. And he says this, he says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over livestock and all wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is God's word. You may be seated. So th this, this concept of the image of God is really um, foundational to how we view people, how we even view um, ecology, how we view the earth, how we view the environment, th things like that, that God has put us over, over that and he created humans different than all the other animals that we actually reflect the image of God. So um, I, 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 wa I want you to understand how fundamental that actually is to our culture. Um, Last week, we talked about abortion, right? And I laid out the, 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 the case that for, for why abortion, um, except for in, in, in the, um, the instance that it threatens the mother's life, it, it is really an assault on the image of God in, in a child, right? And then if, if the mother's life is in, in danger, then you also have a dilemma because the image of God in her is being threatened as well, too. So th that, that is an ethical dilemma, if, if, that, if that makes sense. Um, but, but here's the thing. The belief that all humans are made in the image of God has incredible ramifications on civil rights, if you think about it. You know, when, you, uh, when, when Martin Luther King gives his, um, the American Dream sermon that he gave, right, he talked about how all humans have been made in God's image. It doesn't matter what color they are. It doesn't matter um, what country they're from, wh where it is, that they've all been made in God's image, and every one of them has intrinsic worth. Like they all have, they're all worthy of dignity. They're all worthy of respect. They're all wor worthy of, of all of that. And I don't think anyone in this room would disagree with that, right? If someone's like, I disagree, I guarantee this room would be like, get a rope. Okay, I'd be like, be Christian. <laughs> you know. Um, and then the belief in the image of God, it, it affects how you view gender as well, too. It affects, affects how you view sexuality. Oh, by the way, I forgot. You're going to drink through a fire hose tonight. There might be a lot of information coming at you. We have an outline. If you'd like an outline, raise your hand, and some of our, our folks will pass them out. Hold them high, and they'll just keep going. And I, I'm, I'm going to keep talking, okay? So next week will be sexuality. So let me, let me explain to you why the Imago Dei, the image of God, really it sets a precedent for how we, we see gender and the issue, the struggle our culture has today with it to be honest, because there's people on both, both, sides of the, both sides of the aisle. Here's the thing. Um, when the Declaration of Independence was penned, the first line of it says this. It says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Okay, so it, it says we hold these truths self-evident, that, that everyone is equal in the image of God, and because you're, everyone is equal in the image of God, they have these certain inalienable rights. They should be treated with dignity. They should be, you know, and it, you, you go down the line, right? And we would all agree, everyone should have human rights, amen? Here's the problem. When you ask, where did, the, where did this thought come from? Where did Thomas Jefferson and the founding fathers that have shaped our culture, we have to be honest, where did they get this view from? And modern, you know, if you go to Fresno State or you go to UC somewhere, um, today they'll tell you, they'll be like, oh, well, it's just a value of Western culture, which is not inherently true. Because the reality is, um, the Greeks and the Romans believed in slavery. The, Aristotle, who was one of the great minds of Western culture, believed that there were some races that were born to be slaves. They were genetically set out to be slaves. They're inferior to Greek people. Romans believed there were races that were inferior to the Romans. They based all human worth and dignity based on what was in your blood. And, and, and who, what family you came from and where you came from. So that is not where that view that all people are created equal in, in our Declaration of Independence or in our, our, um, our Constitution. And that really sets the precedent for, for how we, we see all people. 
So where did that come from? Well, I talked about it last week. There's a, a guy named um, Brian Tierney from Cornell University. And um, he began doing some research. And he wasn't a Christian whatsoever, but he reluctantly figured out that it actually, that view evolved out of medieval jurisprudence and a, and a, and a biblical view from the, from the Catholic Church. And it began to evolve. And then the Protestant Reformation happened. And then it exploded. That view um, le- led to that. So that view comes from the, from, from the Bible. But here's the problem. If our culture and our belief system and how people should be treated is based on the image of God, but if we're really honest, and I said this last week, we live in a post-Christian society now. We're finding quicker and quicker less poli- people believe in the God of the Bible. And if you, you don't believe in the God of the Bible, but the very essence of human rights is founded on a belief in your creator who made you in his image, then where do you get, where do you find that belief that all people are created equal? If there's no God, then, and, and the reality is we are just evolved animals and it's survival of the fittest. Frederick Nietzsche, he mourned the death of religion because of that. He knew, he took this thought to his furthest logical extent. He said, if we are just evolved animals, then, then, then yeah, how, how do, where do you get human rights from? Modern philosophers, guys that have actually thought this through, most of us, um, we just want to have good coffee and avocado toast. Take our philosophy class, get an A, and move on. We don't want to think about that because it, if you actually take that to its furthest logical extent, if there is no God, Nietzsche was right. Guys like Peter Singer from uh, Princeton University who has said all human life and human rights really be, should be based on capacity then. Do they have the capacity? Are they moral beings? Can they make a free choice? Can they, can they do those things? That's an awful thought if you think about it. Because keep taking that to its furthest logical extent. That means a baby in the womb does not have free choice. It is not a moral being yet. It is not a thinking being. It is not conscience or safe, you know, as far as we know. But neither are babies that are a couple weeks old. They're not moral beings either. Neither are the elderly with Alzheimer's. Neither are the severely mentally handicapped and disabled. So you just keep taking that further, right? And the, the Romans, they, they operated, Western culture operated on capacities until the Christians came and said, no, we believe in the image of God. We're not a one-issue people. It's not just abortion. We, we'll, we want your orphans. Don't send your widows out in the woods to starve because that's what they used to do because food was limited. We'll take care of them. We want to care for all people because we believe in the image of God that everyone has worth wherever they're at. That's a quick review of what we went over last week, so you know. Now, you may have all kinds of questions about that, and I get that. You should listen to next week before you ask a ton, ton, of, the, ton of those questions. So we're going to do, do a couple things tonight about um, gender. One, what does the scripture say about it? I'm going to talk about the great lie that we find, find in scripture. Um, it te- teaches us the great lie that humans have believed for, for all millennia. What is a Christian supposed to believe about gender? And then how do we live this out? What does this look like? In all of it, I want you to look at it, again, not through a Fox lens, not through a Republican lens, not through a Democrat lens, but through a lens of the word, because we're a people of the book. So we're going we're, we're, we're gonna to start with just what does the Bible say about it? Well, I just read to you from, from Genesis, right? And Genesis talks about how God created man in his image, right? He made male and female. He made them distinct. He goes on to talk about how the two will come together, that biologically, the two will come together and make one. Now, there's kids in the room. I'm assuming most of you had sex ed at some point, or you got married, or you figured it out along the way. And, and you understand how two become one, and then they become three, or maybe four or five, or six, or seven, it, 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 depend, depending on, on, on how, how many you have. But I want you to understand how the Bible is interpreted first, because there's all kinds of places in the Bible, you know, you ever, when I was a kid, I'd sit in a church, Sunday night service, actually, 
And our pastor did a different sermon every Sunday night, and usually he taught something a little heavier, a little deeper like this. And I remember sometimes it was over my head, and I'd get bored, and I'd just kind of zone out. And they always had Bibles in the pews we sat in, so I'd pull the Bible out, and I'd just start looking for the weirdest Bible verse ever. There's like one in Leviticus that if two men are fighting and a man's wife comes out and grabs the other man by the testicles, um, that... um, they should chop her hand off and show no mercy. And I was like, that's hilarious, right? And there's all kinds of crazy verses in the Bible, right? So I want you to understand um, really how the Bible's interpreted first, and then, and then, and then we'll kind of interpret this, this passage in Genesis. First and foremost, the, the Bible can never mean something more than it meant to the people that were first reading it, okay? So, so when God is... Re- You know, when Genesis is being dictated, one of the things you have to realize is it's being dictated to a Stone Age people orally, right? So, um, one, sometimes you get people that get caught up and they want to prove Genesis 1 and 2 scientifically, and that was never the intention of Genesis 1 and 2. Um, That's like trying to figure out if the iPhone is in the Bible. It's not. They didn't have the scientific method back then. They didn't have any of that. God was trying to explain to Stone Age people and people in 2022 that have little computer televisions in their pocket that are more powerful than the biggest mainframe computer we ever had in the 70s or 80s. And he was explaining that he was the creator of all the cosmos and he made you and him in his image. He didn't make himself. He made you in his image, in his image, okay? Okay. So, so what's the plain meeting? That's the first thing you have to go to. And then um, you have to look at, okay, well, what does the whole Bible say about it? What's the whole narrative arc of the Bible say about it? What do other passages say? And then, then, then you bring those, those together. And then the last one is you probably should look at, well, how have other believers over the last 2,000 years traditionally read this too? Because just because someone lived in another era than you doesn't mean that they weren't as smart as you. Uh, we tend to have a, a, uh, an age bi- bias where we think, oh, those people from the 1700s, or oh, those people from the 1500s, or oh, those people from the, the you know, uh, 300 BC, you know, and, you know, you can start thinking they weren't as smart as you, but I'm guessing Plato was smarter than all of us in this room, right? Except for Dr. Davidson, but anyways, okay. <laughs> I kid. So, um... So, so you, you do those things. So, right, there's places in the Bible where it talks about, you know, you shouldn't wear clothes of, of different uh, types of thread together, right? You shouldn't eat pork. You shouldn't do this, right? That's all in the Old Testament. Well, what does the whole Bible say about it? Well, what you find is that was the law for Jewish people. God was creating a culture. They were culturally Egyptian. He pulls them out of Egypt, and he's trying to create a culture, out of them. And he gives them laws, a way to live different, a way to live separately, to look different than all the other nations, to be set apart, to be his holy people. And he gives them this law. You get to Acts, the book of Acts, and in the book of Acts, all of these Gentile now, Gentiles now, non-believers, are becoming believers in the way. They're becoming believers in Jesus. And the Jewish believers are like, wait, he's the Jewish Messiah. Do they get to eat ham on Easter? Do they need to be circumcised? Do they need to follow all of these laws? And what the apostles came together and they said, no. Why would we put the yoke of the law on the Gentiles? It was not for them. It it was for Israel. And then he tells the Gentiles, um, do not eat meat sacrificed to idols that has blood in it and abstain from sexual immorality. And just follow the general law, love the Lord your God. See, so what happens is, a lot of times that people that are trying to pick the Bible apart, they'll go find little nitpicky verses in the Old Testament, and the reality is, they didn't read the whole of Scripture. They don't understand the narrative arc of Scripture, they've never read the Scriptures before, they just went on Google and found some page, like skeptics.com or something, and you know, so that they could pick apart and get the belief they want, because we all like to live in an echo chamber. It feels good for our brains. So... What does it say? Genesis 1, 27 and 28. If you look, it says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number. 
So right away, the, the Old Testament is alluding, it doesn't talk about transgenderism or, or anything like that, but it's alluding right away that you were created a certain way. You were created a male or you were created a female. And then the, the next jump to it is he tells them to be fruitful and increase. And that is a clear indication of what your biological birth sex was, okay? So that's just one verse though, right? So, I, and we don't have enough time that I, I go through every scripture in the Bible to do that. So I'm just gonna go, well, okay, if Jesus was God, what did Jesus think about this whole thing? And I'm gonna jump forward and I'm just gonna read you Matthew 19. Because a lot of times, too, like, you know, like, people will be like, well, I don't believe that in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus did. Well, if Jesus really is the Son of God, and he really is God in flesh, and he believed it, it must be true, or he's not true. Or he's not the, the, the Son of God. So, so look what Jesus says in Matthew 19. He says, some Pharisees came to him to test him, and they asked is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Here's what I want you to know. In that day, um, the, the, there was the Old Testament, but then they had a book called the Mishnah, and it was an interpretation of the Old Testament. So if the Old Testament's about that thick, the Mishnah was thousands of pages. And, you know, when someone said, hey, or when the Old Testament said, don't work on the Sabbath, keep it holy. People started going, well, can you explain exactly what work is? And there would be thousands, tens of thousands of words and pages on how you cannot work on the Sabbath. And it got to be ridiculous to where, like, you can only walk 1,500 yards from where you were at, from your home. So one of the interpretations was, well, if you tie a string to your home, and everyone on Friday night ties strings to their houses all around the village. As long as you keep your hand on that string, you can walk more than 1,500 yards because technically you never left your house. This is what humans do. You and I do it too. We're, I mean, come on, let's be honest, right? Did God really say that? How, what if it's like this? That's what we do to God's word all the time, right? So... The Pharisees come to him and they ask about divorce because in the, in the Mishnah, you, you know, you could get a divorce for any reason. As a matter of fact, if a woman burnt your food, you could divorce her. And back then, ladies, you couldn't just go get a job and, and, and you know, lose some weight and be like, I'll show him and take some hot Instagram pictures. You were on the streets. You either were homeless. You had to go back to your father's household. You were disgraced and he hated you for it. Or you went into prostitution. If you're a widow, you were, you were deemed to be broke the rest of your life. So Jesus, and th this is typical, right? This, I could picture this if it was 2022, right? There, the Pharisees would be the trolls on, on um, social media or on YouTube right now. And they're like, is it lawful to divorce your wife? And then look what Jesus says. He says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning... The creator made them male and female, he said. For this reason, a man will leave his father and his mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And then he says, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. And then they go, well, why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce to send her away. And he says this. He says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. So right away, you, you catch that God made human beings in his image. He made women in his image. He made men in his image. You know, and if you think about Thomas... Jefferson, right? And he said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Well, self-evident is something when you look at it and you go, oh, well, yeah. And the traditional view that Christians have had for 2,000 years is that um, gender is not fluid. That the, the reality is you were, if you were born a male, it was because God made you in his image that way. And just because you, you, you sense that you're, you, you're not that doesn't necessarily mean that. Because I'm going to be honest with you. There are things in me that my nature, I was born that God's called me to go against. And I'm going to be honest. I'm going to out all the men in this room right now, okay? 
Sorry, guys, I'm throwing you all under the bus. Ladies, don't be angry at him. This is biology. Men, although we are monogamous creatures, hopefully, right? We'd have no problem having multiple sex partners. As a matter of fact, biologically, that's kind of how it works. And as women, biologically, they tend to lean, lean more towards monogamy because sex is dangerous biologically for them. If they get pregnant, it means something. And those of you that are pro-choice, you've talked about it to me, right? So my nature is toward adultery, what God said. That's why we have a six billion dollar porn industry right but what god's word tells me is that 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 is lust and it destroys my soul so what i do is i go against what my very flesh my nature wants because i realize it'll destroy my soul and i don't go but i was born that way i'm naturally horny (laughs) yeah i said it Do do you understand that? That that there are things in our image, because we talked about it last week, that in the image of God that is in us that have been broken. And that, that thing in me as a man is a broken part of the image of God. I was born with broken parts of the image of God in me. It was not that way from the beginning. You, I was not designed by God to be that way. I was designed by God to be with one. And together the, the two would become one flesh. But we also know in a broken and fallen world how difficult it is to stay married. Amen? I believe it was the great uh, Sue Love, Pastor Dave Love's uh, wife. She said at, a, at a, a women's conference she spoke at here at the church, she said, well... And she's this sweet little Oklahoma gal. And she said, well, if I would have killed Dave the first time I wanted to, I'd be getting out of jail right about now, 21 years. (laughs) So I'm going to talk to you about that breaking in, in the image of us. And that's the next part, it's the great lie. See, when you read Genesis chapter 3, you read Genesis 1 and 2, it's about how God created the earth, the heavens, the earth, the cosmos, all of it, and then how we broke it, how it was intended to be, how it was from the beginning, and then what happens is in Genesis chapter 3 is that um, Adam and Eve disobey God. God puts them in this garden called Eden. I'll take you to the place where it is, it's mind-blowing. Um, it doesn't look like a garden anymore. It's, well, it is, it's kind of like the garden, it's garden of Gethsemane. But anyways, um, he puts them in this garden. He says, tells Adam, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You can eat from any tree here. Um, don't do that. He ends up, Adam's there by himself and he realizes it's not good for man to be alone. I want you to think about that, ladies. God had made everything in Genesis 1 and 2 and he kept calling it good. It is good. It is good. It is good. There was no sin. There was no flaws. There was nothing. But when he makes Adam, he looks at Adam and he goes, no, it's not good. It's not right yet. And then he makes woman. He makes Eve. Right? So there's not, it's not an Adam's better than Eve. Eve is better than Adam. It's the two become one, right? The two become one flesh. That, That was how it was designed. There's male and female. Biologically, they become one flesh. You know how anatomy works. You know how Legos work, okay? I got kids in the room. Not mine. My kids would be throwing up in their mouth a little bit if I'm talking about sex. And Satan comes to Eve and says, you should eat from the tree of God, knowledge of good and evil. And she goes, well, no, we're not, we're not supposed to. If we, you know, if we, we can eat from any tree, but if we eat from this tree, we're going to die. And then here's what Satan says to her. He says, in Genesis 3, 4, and 5, he says, you will certainly not die. For God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That was a half truth. 
Yeah, their, her eyes would be open. But this is the lie the devil has told me and you and every human on this planet, and we buy it hook, line, and sinker. And here's really what's going on. He was saying, Eve, God's holding out on you. There's more to this life than what he wants to give you. And if you'll take more than what he wants to give you, you'll see, I've got the secret. I've got the way. I've got the way to make you happy. I've got the way to to fulfillment. You'll know good and evil. You'll have, you'll be self-actualized. You will find yourself. You'll be your true, authentic self. You heard that pop psychology anywhere? And that's been the lie human beings, Christians and non-Christians, have believed for thousands and thousands of millennia. That God's holding out on you. And if my body says I should do this, then I should do that so I can become my authentic self. But what the scripture is saying is that, no, you were created in my image, and yes, you broke it when you sinned, because here's what we find, is um, she eats it, Adam is just standing there like, okay, he eats it too like an idiot. He was the one God told. Um, Right away, God, God comes, and when God comes, it says that they felt shame. They felt shame. They instantly felt naked, they felt shame. And here's what I I want you to understand. Shame is something that's um, been in human nature. It's part of our flesh again. And uh, we use shame as a weapon, to be honest. Human beings do, we all have at some point in our life. We make people feel bad to get what we want, to get them to believe what we want. Religion does it all the time. One of the things I loved about coming to Clovis Hills is that um, uh, this church pastor, Steve, and his team had initiated this thing called a no-guilt policy. And, and Steve had this aversion to shame. And it was always like, no, come to Jesus as you are. But he won't leave you as you are. He'll change you. And they felt shame. And the first thing that happens when you feel shame is you begin to blame, right? Adam, why did you do this? I told you not to. The woman, you put her here. You made her all pretty and stuff, right? You know, and then Eve, what'd you do? The, the Satan, the snake, you put him in here. He tricked me. And, and we blame. And then they be, they, they, it says that they covered themselves. That they felt no shame before that, but then they covered themselves. And here's the other thing that happens when, because of our sin, we don't even know who our true authentic selves are. We're all wearing fig leaf armor. We're all pretending to be better than we are. There's deep insecurities and shame in every human being. Psychologists will tell you that. It usually drives a huge part of our negative behaviors. You know those things you keep doing in your life, you wish you stopped doing, but you keep doing them? Probably shame is behind that. It's because we believe the great lie that God is holding out on you and there's more to this life. And if you just go get it yourself, man, you'll find it. Now, I say that, and our culture has really embraced that, especially in, in, the, in the last decade. It, uh, our culture has always been wicked. Let's be honest. We're wicked. People are wicked. I am too. But in the last decade, they've, they've even left a belief in God because God was holding out on us. And we have a whole generation, uh, millennials, Gen Z, even, even part of mine, Gen X, we've been deconstructing the Christian faith and picking our own new faith, figuring out what we want to believe, and it's a customized faith. And again, that's fine if you do that, but it, you don't really believe in any God whatsoever. You just believe in a made-up God that you made up. You, you hands down believe in a God you made up. You might as well be Scientology. I know that hurts, but it, it's, it's, it's really true. So shame makes us blame. Well, God made me this way. What Jesus would say was that's not how it was intended to be. So last week, I had this mirror, and I talked about how God made you to reflect his glory. And I had a mirror. I don't know what I did with it. So, and, but here's what I did. I took the mirror, 
and it was very dramatic for those that were here. And I threw it on the ground and it shattered. Because this is what happened when human, humankind disobeyed God is we broke the image of God in all humans. And all of us still are in God's image, but we all are like these little broken shards of the mirror and we don't reflect God's image properly anymore. And this is why Jesus came back or Jesus came to earth because what Marlena recited in, in our, I'm preaching now, I stood up, sorry. What Marlena talked about during worship, she read from Colossians 1.16, and she said that Jesus, right, is the image, the perfect image of the invisible God. It means it was never broken by sin, it was none of that. He's reflecting exactly who God is in his character, who he's supposed to be. He was the firstborn of all creation, and this Jesus came to put all the broken mirrors back together so that one day we would all reflect God's image properly again. And when I received Jesus Christ as a little six-year-old at Sparky's in a, in a, a thing called Awanas, which Awanas, if you don't know what it is, it's like Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts for the Flanders family. It's like, onward, Christian soldier. And, and I did that. That was when... God began the reclamation project in a very broken little boy. And I was a broken teenager. I was a broken 20-something. I was a broken 30-something. I was a broken 40-something. And now I'm a broken 50-something. But I'm not who I was yesterday. I'm not who I was when I was 40. And God is restoring his image in me. And this is the whole point of Christianity. We are not perfect we're actually just as messed up as the world. And our problem is we don't see everyone else in the world as people made in God's image. And when, let's be honest, most evangelical Christians are right-leaning. And when you hold contempt for people that are left-leaning, you're marring the image of God in them. Every time you watch the news and you curse Joe Biden, you're marring the image of God in him. Oh, buckle up, lefties, because you're the same way. I get on the friggin' elliptical at GB3 every day, and there's Fox and CNN, and it's hilarious watching the two because they're marring conservatives, the image of God in them too, and they're the problem. And see, here, here, here's the thing. Our culture has picked it up because we live in a capitalist society, and your eyeballs create ad space, and it creates money and all of that. So if they can touch your limbic system, that's the fight or flight part in your brain, and make you scared or angry or furious or shocked, you'll keep watching, and you'll keep clicking, and you'll keep scrolling rather than moving the information to the cerebral cortex, the front of your brain, and thinking it through rationally. You don't think you're any different than any other human on this planet right now, that like your cerebral cortex is bigger than everyone else's. Well, you could think that, but you're, okay. So, what does that mean? How do we live? What, okay, if the, if the traditional, traditional view is that, that God has made you in, either a male or a female biologically, and that, that's really who you are. How, how should we live? Let me tell you a little story. Years ago, um, came across someone that was um, transgender, and um, they had, it was just a crazy story. And they had, this church I was part of, they, the, the, this person was born a man, um, became a Christian, like led worship in a church, thought or realized or what, it's, this is their story, um, decided that, that, you know, got married, had kids, decided he was gay, started having, you know, illicit affairs with uh, other men, ended up um, contracting HIV, giving it to, to his wife, realized I'm not gay, I just am a woman, began transitioning to become a woman. Um, and then uh, realized that actually I'm a lesbian, and they're going through through this transition. And and this is I'm going to be honest with you. This person was a beautiful soul. I had coffee for two hours with this person, and we talked about it. 
and you know they were so gracious they they, they I don't know what his her pronouns were but whatever see how confusing this is but anyways th- th- this person was incredibly gracious and we, we talked about it and I said well here's the thing like if you were born a man you know like the the, the biblical view is that you're still male and then even 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 if the Bible's wrong and you're female like you're a man who was a became a woman who ends up being a lesbian like you want to go to a women's retreat that's another conflict of interest like we we can't do that you're welcome to be here at this church you can come be part of a growth group you can you know we'll find a place for you to serve like we love you we want you to hear the gospel we want you to 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 grow in Christ I can't change your gender at this point anyways you've had a, a reassignment surgery um, ironically, this person was telling me, too, that the state paid for their surgery, but their um, daughter had a speech impediment and wouldn't pay. They paid for her to get a, um, her, the transgender person, to get a, uh, a speech therapist to help her talk, learn to talk like a woman, but the state wouldn't pay for her child that had a speech impediment. And she goes, yeah, it's totally hypocritical, and she understood it. And, and finally, we, we had this beautiful conversation and I, I said, I go, so you know, like, we're like, we typically hold a traditionally view, traditional view on marriage and, and, and sexuality and gender and all of that. Like, what makes you want to come here? There's a lot of churches that are very open to that. And there's transgender bishops in the Episcopal Church. And, and she said something really interesting. She said, I know there are. And I know this is going to sound weird to you, Sean. I, and, I, and I disagree with your view on um, gender, but I want to go to a church that believes the Bible is God's word. What do you do with that? I still don't know what to do with that. And I said, well, you are welcome. I'm not going to let you join a women's group. You don't need to join a men's group. You can join a, a, a multi-gender group. There's a place for you here. I saw her in 2019. She works at Disneyland now. She doesn't live here in the Valley. Um, a beautiful person, to be honest. Beautiful person, very kind, very gracious. Um, put me on blast on Facebook for something, but was super gracious about putting me on blast. Like, messaged me, and, hey, I put you on blast. Here's why. But, you know, just <laughs> super, you know what I mean? But here, here's, here's really how we have to live it out. Here's what this means. It, it's a super sticky and difficult situation. But if someone who is transgender is made in the image of God, and even if they've transitioned or they've done whatever, they're still made in the image of God, and we still need to learn to treat them with a love, a dignity, a respect. It doesn't mean that, that we go, nah, everything's cool. Be whatever you want. We're still going to... God's word is still God's word, and we have to hold to it. And there will be times where God's word comes up against your cultural values. You know, when you get to Acts 2.42, and it says that everyone was sharing, that does not really hold well in a, in a uh, capitalist, individualistic society. And we start talking about giving, everyone goes, oh, hold on. Slow down, pastor. Get back to the forgiveness stuff. That sounds like communism. And here's the reality. If it's God's word, it will eventually butt up against your beliefs. And if the Bible never butts up against your beliefs, it's because you've rewritten it or you've, you've made God in your own image to fit what you want. I do want to tell you this, though, because I also had someone this morning, they were a visitor at church, and they're like, hey, we heard you're like the anti-woke pastor, and you're going after the woke people. And I was like... No, I'm not. That's, no. Because again, those people are made in God's image too. They can mar my image all they want. And Jesus has told me to turn the other cheek. Although it's really hard. I, I have a smart mouth, man. I get myself in trouble on Twitter all the time. But anyways, I had to quit Twitter, to be honest. I'm sober from it a year and a half. That's a lie, six months. Anyways, um... <laughs> 
part of recovery. Um, but we have to be honest. It's been forced on our culture. You're, right now, if you don't believe it, you're, you're viewed as a bigot. Um, there is actually a woke mob. In 2013, I don't know if you know this, it, the APA, the American Psychological Association, they considered transgenderism a, a disorder. We have 100 years of study on it. And it was considered a disorder, but in 2013, it, it was changed to dysmorphia because they didn't like saying someone had a disorder, that it was wrong. Um, there's an interesting thing, too. Um, there's no solid scientific evidence for it. Now, th there, there, there is something um, called intersex. That's 0.02% of the, the, the population. That's very, very small. But I, I, want you, I want you to know this. In the last, um, we have 100 years of study of solid scientific research on tra transgender, all, all of that. And it was, for 100 years, it was primarily in boys, almost 98%. It showed up in boys. For 100 years. Um, in the last decade... We don't have good stats in America, but because England has nationalized health care, they have great stats on things like that. It has increased 4,000% in teenage girls. I want you to think about that for a minute. 4,000%. And you go, well, because it's more open now and people are cool with it. Um, that, if that were actually true scientifically, then it would happen in all aged women and in boys. And it's barely moved in boys in the last 100 years, and they increased 4,000%. There's a, um, a woman, she wrote for the, the Wall Street Journal until they fired her when she wrote this. She wrote a book. And she writes about how social media um, and, you know, to, to be trans now is to be highly esteemed in our culture. Like, you're so brave, right? And what's happening is you're getting all of these teenage girls who, you know, when you're a teenager, you're incredibly, I mean, I'm, I'm 50 and I'm incredibly insecure. Imagine me at 14, right? And these teenage girls, they, they, they tend to kind of um, gather socially in, in mania. That's a reason why therapists don't put bulimics and anorexics in, in group homes together because they'll never conquer it. They actually feed it in each other. Right, so you have social media, and you have you have you know my let's say my 17 year old daughter comes out and says, "That's it, guys, I'm trans now." Her 347 girlfriends on social media go, "You're such a hero, we love you," and it just lifts it up and it builds that in them. And here's here's the deal: if it's increased five thousand four thousand percent in in um, girls 12 to 21. In England, I'm sure it's that here. And that's a future problem from, for the church. We have to figure out how we still deliver the good news of Jesus to them. And in our state, they allow um, sex change as a teenager. You, you have to get a note. My daughter got her nose pierced, and, like, we had to be there. But if she decided she was transgender, she could get hormones without us ever knowing. She could begin to apply for gender reassignment surgery. She could have her breasts removed without, with, well, I'd, I'd know eventually, right? But, like, th this, this is the culture we live in. And here, here's the thing. Um, we're not at war with people. If you're a believer in Jesus, your enemy is not people. The Bible says that great lie came from the devil in Revelation um, 12. It says that he is the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that says, you're not enough. God's holding out on you. And it says he stands before God day and night and says, you saw Sean. You saw what Sean thought about that woman. You saw what Sean thought about that, that person. You, shaw, you saw Sean in GB3 judging people. You, shaw, you saw Sean's contempt for that person on TV or his contempt for that person. Or, you know, when, when his neighbor kids run on his lawn, get off my lawn. I'm 50 now, so I yell at kids. Um, and he's always accusing me. He's always accusing me. But we have to figure out how to receive people that, are, that disagree with us, too. And how this can be a place where anyone could hear the good news of Jesus and come to belief. Because here's what I know. Um, 
Yes, I, I, do, I do believe it is not God's will for someone to change, change their gender. And um, ultimately, that is sin. I am the chief of sinners, and if Jesus died for my sin, he died for that sin too, and that person is made in God's image. They're worthy of love and respect. They're, they're, they're worthy even to be part of the family of God. So we're, what are we to do? We're to be gracious. We don't forfeit God's word. We don't forfeit the truth. Sometimes it makes us look double-faced because, like, we love everyone, but... But hold on, the Bible says this. And then the other is, as Christians, we have to start being bold. Being bold doesn't mean being a jerk. I used to think when I was younger that being bold meant being a jerk. Like, Gah! you know, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that whatsoever. Um, it, it means actually lovingly and graciously giving an answer for the hope that lies within you. And not being afraid what people think of you. And if you're called a bigot, you, st you stand under the grace and the mercy of Jesus, not the grace and the mercy of our culture. G.K. Chesterton said, fallacies do not cease to become fallacies when they become fashion. Something is true or it's, or it's, or it's not. So, don't fear man. It says in Proverbs that the fear of man is a, is a snare, it's a trap. I spent much of my life being afraid of man. As a matter of fact, I didn't even want to do this series. I've avoided this kind of stuff for a long time. And it, it was finally, you know, especially it was funny talking with Pastor Jason last night when he said, do you feel like you've abdicated your prophetic voice in our generation that pastors have? And I said, I totally feel that way. He goes, I do too. So Jesus said this. I'll close with this. Jesus said that you must be born again. And I want you to think about what that means, being born again. Because really, it's an affront on all people. Because we live in a culture where really our culture wants us to accept people exactly how they are. They don't need to change. There's nothing wrong with them. But what Jesus said when he was saying to people that you need to be born again is he was saying, Everyone's got it wrong. You all need to start over. There's a different way to live your life. There's a different way to be. And, 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 and it's not that you don't need to just try harder. Because how many of you, you, you know, maybe there's been a, a sin in your life and you've tried harder and you still didn't kick it. Show of hands. Oh, we're getting honest in here tonight. Good job, guys. Some of these services, I do that. There'd be like one guy from CR. He'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Everyone else would be like, oh, no, I don't sin anymore, Pastor. I'm perfectly happy. You don't need to just try harder. He said, you need to be made new. The image of God that I made you in is broken, and I want to remake it in you. I want to make something beautiful. I want to take that broken thing and make something even more beautiful than that broken Im Im image of God in you. And to, to say, God made me this way, he, he didn't, sin broke us that way, and Jesus came to, to, to remake it. And for in him, he is the image of the invisible God. So my, my hope for you guys tonight is, is this. Wh wherever you stand on this issue, it's not my job to make you believe things. Like, you have to come up against things and belief really is, is, is a process. And I, I, have, I have to tell you, in my 20-something um, years of being a pastor, even my beliefs have grown. As the, the more I've learned God's word, the more I've learned how God works, the more I've learned how people work, my beliefs have grown. I don't have the same exact beliefs I had when I was 25 years old. Thank God. Thank God there's not a digital record of any of my sermons when Marlena was in my youth group. I, yeah, I'd have no job right now. I'd be canceled on every front. I said incredibly stupid things. I said awful things. I was not full of grace. It was mostly truth. The Bible was not a sword. I used it like a billy club to beat people with. But Jesus being full of grace and truth, he looks at you, he loves you right where you're at with your beliefs that you have.
But my hope for you is that you would begin to learn God's word. At some point in your life, you would pray and read God's word more than you are on social media. If you're a teenager, that you would be informed by God's word and not by TikTok. Because your facts come from TikTok. If you're an old person, that you would be informed by God's word and not by Fox News. That you would be informed by God's word and not CNN. And it doesn't mean that you stick your head in the sand and become Amish. What it means is that when you see information out there, the filter is through the word of God. Not through what's out there and what, what the world is teaching, and then we filter the word of God through what the world is teaching. It's the opposite. And this is the way of the kingdom. And God has great things for you when you live that way. His way is always better. And he loves you, and he loves you in whatever belief you have, because he made you in his image. You look just like your daddy. But for some of you, there's a, there's a word in scripture, it's called repentance. It's a Greek word, it's metanoite. And what it means is, it means to change the way you were thinking, the way you were, and to say, you know what, I think I was wrong. I'm gonna go God's way. And probably some of you, you've been Christians your whole life and you need some metanoite because you've held contempt for people that are liberal. You've held contempt for people that don't hold your same political persuasion. And, you, and tonight's a night you have to repent of that and, and, and God will forgive you. We heard the story of the prodigal son. Next week, I'm gonna teach on the second part of the prodigal son, the older brother. He was the guy that did everything right and he was just as lost as the younger brother and we'll get to that. Some of you are that and you gotta repent of that. And then some of you... Your thinking is contrary to the, to the word of God. And Jesus says, are you ready? Are you ready for my way? Because my way is higher. My way is greater. You may not understand it, but begin to walk in it and watch what it does to your life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for every person here. I thank you that you've made every person in this room in your image. Lord, your word is clear that, that sin has broken the image that you've made us in. That there's still a reflection of you. There's still parts of you in us that we could see. But only through Jesus, the image of the invisible God, only through belief in him, only through faith in him, can, can, can we really be remade and become the people we truly are. That, that Lord, there's some people here tonight, Lord, that you, you, they sense you, Jesus, knocking at the door of their heart. They realize they've been believing the lie the devil has is that God's holding out on you. He's keeping happiness from you. He's keeping things from you. And you can go get those things on your own. And tonight they sense that that's the lie. And Jesus, I ask that you give them the courage and the faith to step into who you are. If that's you tonight, the Bible says, but as many as received him, Jesus, to those who believe in his name, he's given them the right to become children of God. That you move from just being someone made in God's image to someone that's adopted into the family of God. There's different rights all together at that point. And God loves you so much, he's going to give you that decision for you to make. If that's you tonight, if that's your decision, I want to encourage you right now, just pray to him. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I realize my sin has broken the image. And Jesus, I'm inviting you in to forgive me and make me the person you created me to be. I don't understand it all, but I'm renouncing the lie that you're holding out on me and I'm grabbing onto you, Jesus, the truth. If that's you tonight, just with every head bowed, every eye closed, I wanna pray a blessing over you. If that was a prayer of your heart, would you do me a favor? Would you just look me in the eye right now? Just put your head up, amen, thank you. Anyone else? You might have to stare hard. Just go. Thank you. Yep. I see you. Father God, I thank you for how faithful you are. We're grateful for you. We love you. And we 
thank you and we pray this. We pray a blessing on the decision that people make. Bless them, set them apart for great things in this world and the next, Lord, for your way, Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. Hey, listen, um, tonight, if that was the prayer of your heart, on behalf of this church, we want to welcome the family of God, amen. Some of you, I know it's late. It's like 7.38 right now. And I apologize, but this is a complex su subject and you can't just cram it in a 30-minute sermon. So um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stand and we're going to worship and we're going to sing this, this song. Um, what's this song called? Yes and Amen. Yeah. And um, if you made that decision tonight to receive Christ or maybe it was a rededication, we have a beautiful tradition where you can... We'll give you a little light bulb and you can screw it into the welcome home sign over there. And it's just a way for you to mark the, the day that on July 10th, the God of the universe knocked at the door of your heart and you had the courage to say, I want Jesus. I'll be hanging out over there while Mar's singing. And if you want that, I'll give it to you. Um, everyone else is going to rise and we're going to sing. So let's worship right now. And then when we're done worshiping, Mar will send you out. If you want to be here for the Q&A, we'll wait about five minutes and we'll do that. So go for it.